Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Talking in the Free World. My guest today is Olga Tokayruk, an independent Ukrainian journalist who is uh, still reporting courageously from inside Ukraine. Uh, Talking in the Free World is a podcast and a YouTube um, a series of conversations hosted by Canada's McDonald Laurier Institute. Let me introduce Olga. Um, she is an independent journalist, as I mentioned, based in Ukraine. She's living in Western Ukraine now. She was previously in Kyiv. Uh, her articles have uh, been published in many periodicals, including Time, The Washington Post, Daily Beast, National Public Radio. Um, she's a non-resident fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis, and Olga's tweets are an extremely important source of information and insight into the war uh, on Ukraine. Um, and I personally have uh, benefited so much from, from her takes on what's happening. Olga, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Mariam. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Maybe we could start a bit by you telling us about your life right now as a journalist. You have uh, chosen to remain in Ukraine and you've described, um, I know that your life is between uh, air raid sirens and, uh, going into and out of uh, bomb shelters. Uh, can you tell us about your life right now? Yes, well, I'm staying in Ukraine, but I cannot say that my life is the same as it was before the war. I think no one in Ukraine, no Ukrainian can say that. Uh, although I still consider myself privileged because uh, I had a place to move to, because I'm originally from Western Ukraine and there are relatives who live here. So uh, when the war started, it was natural to go further west to the western part of the country. So I've been living here with my family, with my daughter for the last three months. And uh, I'm trying to report from here, although, of course, the most uh, important things in terms of the, of course, the fighting and, you know, the military developments, they are happening in the eastern part, in the southern part of the country. But I've never been a war reporter, actually. I never worked on the front line. I always uh, focused more on, you know, the life of people, human issues. So I'm trying to tell uh, in my reporting now how people in Ukraine live, those people who live in different parts of the country, you know, and, you um, so as I said, I, I moved here to western part of Ukraine. It is relatively safer. It's not completely safe. In fact, I'm speaking to you from the basement because it's in a way an office. Uh, my workplace is here because air raid sirens are quite frequent and you never know when it will go off. Uh, so if I have some, you know, work commitments or calls, I prefer to do them here. Yesterday, for example, there was a football game uh, between Ukraine and Scotland and all Ukrainians, most of them were watching it from bomb shelters, me included, and also people I'm staying here with. Um, it's, uh, you know, the life has changed uh, for everyone. It's just the extent to which uh, one's life has been changed. Well, thank you for that description. It's it's hard to fathom for us who are not living in a war zone, much less reporting from one, uh, how your life has been and um, the the service that you are providing to to your country and really to the world, so that people can know what's happening there. Um, you wrote an article in just the last uh, few days about uh, someone who's called the the sheriff of a of a town that has been taken over by Putin's uh, military. And uh, this man, Viktor uh, Maroniak, uh, was severely tortured, but um, is in a unique position to have been able to escape. And uh, you were able to talk with him and he detailed the kind of um, uh, torture that the Russian troops are inflicting on people when they capture them. Um, but you also captured this strong sense of determination. And uh, throughout your reporting and your and your tweets, um, your own commentary, it's it's striking how much you believe in the determination of the Ukrainian people to to win uh, and to uh, to uh, protect their autonomy and their freedom in the future. Um, can you talk about that article and and where you see how you see the people so determined? 
Yes, well, the story of Viktor Marunyak, who is a um, village mayor in Kherson region in southern part of Ukraine that has been occupied by Russians since uh, February 24th, is just one of many similar stories. Uh, his one is prominent because he also featured in a documentary called Ukrainian Sheriffs. This documentary was a Ukrainian a nomination for Oscars several years ago. And it's thanks to the uh, film industry uh, members, you know, filmmaking community that uh, he managed actually to uh, be released. Uh, he, who, you know, he was he was released by by Russian uh, uh, soldiers who were who kidnapped and held him for three weeks in a basement and tortured him and tasered him and broken his uh, nine of his ribs. Uh, so the story of Victor is one of uh, uh, hundreds and thousands of similar stories we might hear less about. Um, uh, what happened to him is happening to many people in those territories that Russia occupied since its full-scale invasion, and especially in Kherson region, you know, because this is the part of Ukraine that uh, is loyal to Ukraine, where there is a strong resistance to the Russian occupation, where we've seen people going out to the streets to protest with Ukrainian flags in the first weeks and months of Russian occupation, facing uh, armed people, facing Russian soldiers. So pe people bravely, courageously, you know, were taken to the streets, protesting and uh, uh, declaring their loyalty to Ukraine. And of course, Russians cracked down brutally on uh, on those people. They arrested uh, participants of these meetings, and they also started abducting uh, local leaders, the uh, mayors, uh, uh, journalists, uh, leaders of uh, local communities, also farmers, because it's a big agricultural area, um, and farmers are a middle class, all the economy of that region is based, you know, on, on the farmers. So uh, Russians started this uh, uh, repressions on a large scale, and actually um, we'll be speaking tomorrow on, on my Twitter, I'll be speaking on a Twitter space about what is happening exactly in that area, in that region, in Kherson, with the Ukrainian human rights defenders and people who directly witnessed what is uh, what is happening there but it gives you an idea you know of that uh, what what ukraine's uh, fighting for ukraine is fighting for the freedom of people to protest for the pre freedom of people to determine their own destiny to hold free elections to have democratic uh, uh, you know um, opportunities have democracy and russians are trying to deprive ukrainians of that they are cracking down they are repressing people uh, who you know have this dignity and freedom, and who want, uh, who do not want to bow to the occupation, and they do not mm -hmm. have popular support, so they are trying to crush this resistance by brutal force. And everyone actually in Ukraine understands that this is what's going to happen in every region if Russia is allowed to take more territory. We've seen what happened, you know, in in Kyiv region, in in Bucha, in Irpin. We've seen the massacre of civilians. We've seen the torture and and the story of rape. So yeah. this is happening everywhere uh, where Russia manages to take hold. So Ukraine is not just fighting for territories, it's fighting for people, for their right to live in a free, independent, democratic country, not to face abuse, persecution, repression, uh, murder for, uh, you know, their views and, and their um, uh, willingness, you know, to, to be free. And the only option is to fight under these circumstances, right? And so how is the fighting going and what does Ukraine need really right now? Well, it's uh, more than three months into Russia's full-scale war uh, on Ukraine, but we are, you know, we are saying here in Ukraine that this war, it not just uh, began three months ago, it actually started in mm -hmm. 2014 with the annexation mm -hmm. of Crimea and the occupation of parts of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk regions. But in fact, this war that began back in 2014 is a continuation of Russian imperial policy towards Ukraine that lasted for centuries. Russia for centuries wanted to colonize, to subjugate Ukraine, to erase Ukrainian identity, to uh, wipe out and cancel Ukrainian uh, language, literature, Ukrainian culture, uh, and of course also Ukrainians' desire to build a democratic community, democratic state. 
Uh, okay, so, so let me ask that, you. That really me... No, no, you know, no choice than to than to fight because otherwise the alternative would be an authoritarian state, repressive state with massive uh, human rights abuse. Yes, you mentioned that this is a, a very old uh, ambition from from the Russians to to subjugate the Ukrainian people, language, culture. Why do you think that is? Well, if we look at Ukraine's history, you know, we'll see a lot of confirmations in that. In fact, uh, Kyiv was uh, founded several centuries before Moscow, and it was Kyiv from where all this Eastern Slavonic uh, civilization, if we can call it like this, has developed. So, um, and, and the, uh, um, you know, um, Russia tries to present it as uh, this territory that has always been Russian. They're saying that Ukrainian uh, nation and Ukrainian state has never existed, that it's an artificial creation, but the, the facts and the history, they state the opposite. And always around the areas, uh, you know, near Kyiv and um, on the territory that is currently modern day Ukraine, we've seen uh, attempts to build a democratic state. And this is in stark contrast to the authoritarian state that was there on the territory of modern day Russia. There were many state formations, uh, but mm -hmm. there was never basically a democracy. While in on the territory of modern day Ukraine, we've seen several attempts throughout history to build a democratic state. And these states existed there for, for centuries. Mm -hmm. So uh, when Russia says that this, you know, uh, somehow this has always been Russia or uh, whatever, it only is true if we are speaking about the last 300 years. And even in that period, there were a lot of attempts to create a democratic state, a Ukrainian state. Just in the 20th century, there were four attempts to proclaim an independent Ukrainian state that were crushed first by the Russian Empire and then by the Soviet Union. And only the fifth attempt in 1991 was successful. But Russia, mm -hmm. it appears, has never put up with that. Uh, there is a, uh, sorry, a huge thunderstorm outside. I don't know if you hear these noises, but they are really kind of scary. And I can imagine, can't imagine how that feels for people, you know, who, who, who felt, who heard the noises of war and the explosions and everything should be pretty scary. So coming mm -hmm. back to the subject. Uh, mm -hmm. Russia has never accepted Ukraine's independence and Ukrainians' desire to build a democratic state. I think this is a primary mm -hmm. reason of this war. Russia wants to destroy Ukraine as a democracy because it can't, uh, uh, you know, it, it sees it a, as a threat to the existence of the authoritarian uh, rule in Russia, uh, a rule yeah. of a tyranny of one person, very different to, uh, you know, what the political system has been in Ukraine in the last 30 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you could speak to uh, world leaders, um, leaders of democratic nations, what would you say are the, the chief the needs of uh, Ukraine right now? And how should the, the free world um, be acting towards the country now? I think the free world should re realize uh, that Ukraine is not only fighting for itself, it's fighting for democracy worldwide. And I think the fate of the democracy worldwide will be decided in Ukraine and the outcome of this war will determine the fate of democracy, whether, you know, democracy will prevail over authoritarianism, authoritarianism, sorry, over tyranny or uh, authoritarian regimes and tyranny will be allowed to take an upper hand because China is watching closely what is happening in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's learning from, you know, what the Western actions are, how Ukrainians are reacting, what Russia does. So uh, this is really, I think, uh, and maybe the biggest battle of the 21st century. Well, at least so far, that's for sure, that is unfolding in Ukraine. What Ukraine needs, Ukraine needs uh, the free world to keep, um, you know, sending um, to Ukraine weapons because uh, Ukraine needs them to repel uh, Russian offensives and, you know, push Russians back also to liberate the territories that have been taken by Russians such as Kherson region that we mentioned before, um, in order to, you know, free those millions of people who are there from this terrible repressive system, from huge human rights abuses that are happening to them. Ukraine also needs, of course, financial assistance to rebuild its economy because uh, Ukrainian economy has collapsed by half. And uh, it is, we are already starting to feel that there are uh, shortages of fuel, there are shortages of some, um, you know, food staples, and I'm afraid it will only get worse uh, by the end of the year. 
and uh, of course, Ukraine also needs political support. Uh, you know, uh, for example, providing Ukraine with the EU candidate status would be a really, really important uh, development and a boost to Ukrainians who are, mm -hmm. as I said, not just defending themselves, not are just fighting for themselves, but they are fighting for the Western values, for the values of the European Union, and who have long, you know, ago expressed their desire to be a part of the EU. And of course, try to avoid fatigue. It's hard. I know there is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, so many happening around the world. And Ukraine has been on the radar for the last three months. And there is a desire somehow to turn this page and to move on, you know, to, to get back to some sort of normality. But for Ukrainians, it's, you know, it's impossible. Like you can switch off the TV, you can switch off the news, but we will have air raid sirens. We will have, we will hear, you know, sounds of explosions. We will see uh, uh, internally displaced people fleeing from uh, other areas of Ukraine. We will keep receiving news about people we know and we, we love losing their lives on the front line. So we cannot yeah. just, you know, uh, turn this page and, and go back to the normal life. First, we have to win this war. Yes, and um, there is news coming out more and more gradually that uh, one of the horrific things that Putin is doing is abducting forcibly hundreds of thousands, maybe even more, we don't know, uh, children from Ukraine and taking them forcibly to Russia uh, for uh, adoption. We don't really know actually what, what the Russian government is doing with these children. Could you talk about that? Yes, well, Russian officials, they admitted that themselves. They said that uh, about 200,000 Ukrainian children were taken to Russia. And uh, we know that many of these children are orphans uh, who were either taken from you know, the institutions they were living in Ukraine or who lost their parents in this war. So they just became orphans due to, to Russian actions, to Russians killing their parents. And uh, and in some cases, children were also forcibly separated from uh, from their families, uh, and you know it's a, a, a terrible situation. Uh, and, and some historians, such as Timothy Snyder, they said that uh, such actions they amount to genocide, according to yeah. the uh, you know International Genocide Convention. Um, uh, Ukrainian government is uh, you know um, cannot do much in order to. Uh, get these children back to Ukraine. It's uh, Russians do not, uh, you know, they are not open to any sort of negotiations. And what they are st immediately starting to do, also on the occupied territories in Ukraine, they are starting to re-educate these children. So they are introducing Russian curriculum in the in schools in those parts of Ukraine that they entered. They are starting to burn, replace, and you know, uh, throw out basically Ukrainian books uh, and ban speaking Ukrainian language. So um, it looks like a, a deliberate policy of raising a new generation of uh, people, you know, Ukrainian children who would be loyal to the Russian state, who would be filled with Russian propaganda, who would forget about their roots to, to Ukraine, who would be separated from their families back in Ukraine. Um, it's an abominable, you know, crime that it's, 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 it's difficult even to speak about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you have also written about the disinformation and that, that the war is not just one of, of the military and bombs and, and tanks, but also one of uh, what's in people's minds, both in Ukraine, um, in Russia, and then Russia's disinformation towards the West. Um, could you talk about how seriously you think that's impacting the minds of people inside Russia, how it's impacting world opinion. What are your what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think uh, absolutely Russia uses uh, disinformation and propaganda as a weapon, and it's been spreading really genocidal propaganda about Ukraine and Ukrainians on its state media, especially TV, in the last eight years, since 2014, basically saying that Ukrainians, uh, uh, you know, uh, do not have a right to exist, that uh, their country is artificial, that it's a puppet of the Western powers, that uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, politicians should be hanged and things like that. So they are broadcasting this sort of messages uh, uh, daily on prime time 
Russian television and, and you know so you were talking about the disinformation um let me ask you wh- what you think so far has been the most effective disinformation from Putin's regime well yeah i was saying about domestic disinformation you know directed at russians in order to support this invasion in order to conceal the truth about all these uh, terrible war crimes that russian soldiers are committing in order to justify you know russia's uh, barbaric actions but there is also a disinformation directed at the international audience uh, not just in the west but also in other countries in the global south where it's more successful than in the west So while Russians are doing that, they are trying to undermine, you know, the support for Ukraine to blur the truth. And especially as the attention wanes and as international reporters tend to leave Ukraine and switch to other topics, disinformation efforts are becoming more aggressive. And, you know, journalists might leave Ukraine, but those who are doing disinformation and propaganda will continue doing that. So that's, I think, is a, a real risk now as we are entering this Uh, second stage of this war when more or less the world has got used to it. I mean, of course, the support to Ukraine is still continuing and it's very important that Ukraine is continuing to get weapons. But there are also voices in some Western countries, maybe not in the US, maybe not in Canada, but certainly in Western European countries that are, you know, putting in doubt Uh, uh, the efficiency of this support to Ukraine. They are saying, well, maybe we shouldn't provide Ukraine with weapons. Maybe that would bring peace. Maybe we should negotiate with Putin. Maybe we should give up a part of Ukraine's territory in order to satisfy Putin's appetite, forgetting that it didn't work back in 2014 when Crimea was basically, you know, given up on. So Russians annexed it, but that didn't stop them from invading first Donbass and then eight years later, other parts of Ukraine. So disinformation actors will be active. They'll be, you know, working on that. They'll be trying to undermine undermine the world's uh, support to Ukraine. We should be aware of that. And I think what was the most efficient uh, for now is to sow doubts about what has actually happened in Ukraine. We've seen that in many countries, like in uh, in Italy, for example, which I am familiar with because I speak Italian and I follow the media debate there. There was you, you and know, I both. One- you and I both studied in the city of Bologna. <laughs> wow, great. Yeah, we're yeah. both uh, alumni of Bologna University. I didn't go to the university, but I was there for one year. Yeah, it's a perfect, perfect place to study. Yeah, yeah go fantastic. ahead. I'm sorry. So, so in Italy, you know, um, if, for example, after Bucha massacre, there were prominent figures on TV, former journalists and some pundits and experts who are questioning that massacre, who are saying, well, maybe this is all staged. You know, they were repeating what has been said on, on Russian propaganda TV, which was striking. And at that time, it was still something outrageous. But as the time goes by, you know, these people continue repeating that they are continue putting into doubt Russian war crimes in Ukraine, they are continue questioning. Uh, they continue questioning Russian human rights abuses. They are bl- calling this Ukrainian propaganda, and somehow they are trying to uh, put on the same foot in the, the victim, Ukraine, and the aggressor, Russia, to say, well, you know, Ukrainians, they are also not so good because they did this and they did, they did that, as as if you need to be perfect, you know, in order to be helped. So let's not help Ukraine yeah. because they are not perfect, but it, it shouldn't work like this. You know, it's morally wrong to uh, to say t- such things, but that's how disinformation works. That's, that's how propaganda works. Yeah. And that's, you know, how they achieve their goals by polluting this, in the media uh, debate, by polluting the, uh, diluting the facts and trying to you know equalize the victim and the aggressor yeah and uh that's a a a perfect response to people even in the united states um even in the u.s congress who are repeating or on uh you know some of our most popular um cable tv anchors repeating that russian disinformation about ukrainians um as a way to create some kind of moral equivalence between the aggressor and the victim. And um, if you could speak to particularly uh, Americans or others in the free world, Canadians, uh, Europeans, um, who have who have bought that disinformation uh, from the Putin regime, what would you say to them briefly? Well, I would say check your facts, check your sources, 
and um, realize that this fight is also for your freedom, for the fact, you know, that the citizens of the free world, they can live in democracies, that they continue to enjoy their freedoms. Ukraine is a forefront of this battle. We are defending all of you. Thank you so much, Olga. Um, moving towards the future, how do you see accountability working? Uh, all these crimes against humanity, um, uh, genocide, um, obviously the role of the citizen and the role of the journalist is very important. Um, do you see yourself as a documentarian for uh, a future where um, uh, Putin and his uh, military can be held to account. What else, and, and also what else do you think is necessary to be done so that there can be accountability and justice in the future? Well, certainly I see my role as a journalist, as uh, you know, one who can speak to people, who can share their stories, who can uh, make the world hear their stories about Russian war crimes and human rights abuses in Ukraine. And for several weeks, I've been working together with Ukrainian human rights defenders who are documenting these stories, and I'm providing a platform for them on my social media to you know, make those stories heard and make people uh, across the world realize them. I think human rights and you know human rights abuses is one of the most important aspects of this war, because Russia is not only, you know, waging a war of context, a, a, a conquest, conquest, sorry. So it, mm -hmm. it not only wants to occupy the territory, but it really wants to erase the Ukrainian identity, you know, all um, the, the freedom and democracy that was there and replace it with, you know, a rude authoritarian system from top where, where everything is decided from top to bottom and where only Russian identity can exist, not even, you know, other identities, not even uh, like other ethnicities can exist. We've seen that in Crimea where uh, Tatar, uh, Crimean Tatars and ethnic minority was persecuted severely after uh, the Russian annexation back in 2014. So this war uh, has everything to do with human rights and the Ukrainian fight and the Ukrainian uh, you know, uh, mobilization to defend uh, uh, themselves is also the fight for human rights. So everyone in the world who cares about human rights, who cares about democracy, you know, should should be aware of that and should support Ukraine. Uh, looking into the future, well, definitely, I hope that, you know, the efforts of journalists uh, uh, documenting Russian war crimes and human rights abuses will be important one day to bring those uh, responsible to justice. I know there are also teams of international lawyers and prosecutors working together with their Ukrainian colleagues on the ground and documenting, collecting evidence and speaking to people, you know, uh, uh, to uh, also in hope that one day uh, these crimes can be prosecuted and those responsible uh, brought into account. But of course, this is only possible if, uh, you know, Ukraine wins this war. If yes. uh, and if uh, uh, a Russian regime that comes after Putin's, because anyway, it will not be eternal. One day it will fall. Putin will die as all of us. You know, he's, he's right. a human after all. Uh, so I think the, uh, these crimes can only be, be persecuted when there is a, um, a stark regime change in Russia. And it will take time. So uh, I'm afraid that unless, you know, until Putin is in power or if he's replaced by uh, some of the other hawks in his current entourage, there is little hope actually for, uh, you know, uh, the, the perpetrators of Russian war crimes to be taken into account. But we still, uh, as journalists and, you know, as, as, as Ukrainian citizens and as those who support Ukraine worldwide, we should be working uh, to make them understand, to make those in Russia who are accountable, who are responsible, who give the orders, who execute the orders to kill civilians and to, you know, murder and rape. Uh, they should understand that they are not immune and one day they will, uh, you know, be held responsible. Okay, Olga Tokayruk, um, I can't thank you enough for uh, what you're doing, not just for um, journalism and truth telling, but for the people of Ukraine. And as you said, for everybody, who wants to live in a free and democratic world. Um, the fight that you're fighting is really a fight for, for everyone's uh, freedom 
now and in the future. Uh, thank you. I want to assure you that we will edit this uh, so that it's nice and smooth despite the interruption. Thank you again for your time, Olga, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mariam, and thank you everyone for listening, for your support to Ukraine. It's really important. Thank you again, Olga. Thank you.